Uh, good evening, everyone, and good morning to Ishita. A uh, very warm, warm welcome to all of you. Uh, we are very pleased to have with us today Dr. Ishita Chakraborty. And, uh, you know, she'll be talking about a very interesting area, uh, something which kind of, you know, is relevant to all of us. Uh, so she'll be talking about AI and AI human-based Salesforce hiring uh, using interview videos. So essentially, she studies the problem of AI and AI human-based screening and selection issues in Salesforce hiring. Uh, so uh, I'll just, you know, a little bit introduction about Ishita. So she is currently an assistant professor in the marketing area at Wisconsin Business School. Uh, prior to this, uh, she got her MA, MPhil, and PhD in quant marketing from Yale University School of Management. She also has an MBA from IIM Calcutta and a bachelor's degree in computer engineering from University of Bombay. Uh, her research interests are in digital marketing, online platforms, text and video analytics, and mobile apps. Her research aims at developing algorithmic market research tools to derive richer, accurate, and real-time insights from unstructured data. She uses natural language processing, machine learning, deep learning, and econometric analysis uh, in her work. And uh, she's also interested in word of mouth, negotiations, and brand positioning. Okay, uh, so uh, once again, thanks so much, Ishita. And I know it's early morning for you, but thanks so much for accepting our invitation. A uh, little bit, uh, you know, so for the attendees, you can post your questions on the chat box and I would be happy to take them up with Ishita. And, uh, you know, if you want, you can also unmute yourself. I can unmute you uh, while if you have a question and then you can be part of this webinar as well. Okay? And uh, we also, so any clarification question, anything you feel is relevant, please feel free to ask on the chat box. And we also have a Q&A session at the end. So please uh, feel free to post all your queries. So yeah, without any further delay, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Adrija, for the wonderful introduction. I think uh, I don't need to go through my initial slides <laughs> because of that. But very quickly, uh, yes, I, I am Ashita, and I'm currently um, uh, assistant professor at Wisconsin School of Business. Uh, before doing my PhD, I have worked in both marketing and analytics. So right now, I, I feel like the two things I was very passionate about have come together. Uh, so my research uh, agenda is around deriving marketing insights from unstructured data. And why I think this is very interesting is because like, and these are numbers that all of you might have heard in different, uh, you know, um, different platforms, 80% of the data would be unstructured by 2025. And there's already a lot of unstructured data that firms have. And most firms are actually reporting that un unstructured data is growing faster than structured data. And what I mean by unstructured data is uh, it could be anything that's human generated could be text, like online reviews. It could be videos, like, you know, I'll be talking about interview videos today. It could also be audio data, TikTok videos. So, you know, whatever you, you, you know, um, you can think of and whatever data cannot be like just stored in Excel files, like traditionally it used to be, that is unstructured data. And uh, only less than 1% of the data is being utilized and being studied. So that and that says that firms and researchers, we can all learn a lot by extracting insights from unstructured data, and which explains why there is so much interest both in academia and in industry to learn from these different types of data sources. And I really love this picture, you know, which shows that there is this dark data, hidden data from which we can all learn a lot. And this was uh, primarily what my thesis uh, was based on. Uh, just one second. Um, and the picture that you see here, so this is just to sh uh, showcase, you know, essentially what type of research questions I study and what type of data sets I work with. So uh, the common link in all my work is conversations or communication. I study different types of communication. It could be communication between firms and consumers or vice versa, like online reviews. And my first published paper in Journal of Marketing Research was about, you know, 
uh, extracting sentiment scores from online reviews. I'm currently studying some tweets to understand, you know, how you can quantify things like empathy from tweets. Uh, then there is there are other forms of conversation like, you know, that between firms and employees. And this is where the paper that I'm going to talk about today is based on that. And it's an interview setting where, uh, you know, there are people who are looking for internships and it's a sales internship. So what goes into this process and can we build a predictive model which can automate this process of screening and selecting candidates. So that's the paper that I'm going to talk about today. I also have some work in the stream of, uh, you know, studying conversations between uh, uh, consumers and firms employees so you know nowadays when you write a review that's usually not the end of it the management also has started responding to those reviews so you know what kind of response styles work why they work that's another stream of work I'm interested in uh, so this was a broad overview but coming more specifically to this project and video analytics I think I'm generally very excited about video analytics even before we started working on this project simply because uh, there's an explosion in both generation and consumption of video content so I teach a course in social media marketing and when I ask students uh, what platform do you want to study about all they say is TikTok because they are on TikTok all day so you know there's a rise of video platforms uh, by 2022, 85% of all the internet traffic is coming from video. And this is only going to rise, like, you know, we are going to get even more rich AR and VR data from the metaverse that would just fuel the rise of uh, availability of videos. But uh, the nice thing is, it's not just that videos are available, they have been available for since uh, quite some time. But the interesting thing is that technology has also kept pace. And now we have the technology to actually make sense of complex data structures like videos. And uh, if you see the early work on video analytics, so um, people were studying things which are mostly like I would call video metadata, like, you know, what is the length of the video uh, and, you know, so, uh, things like that, you know, what kind of background is there. But I think that now the interesting thing is we have uh, made so much progress in human activity recognition, pose estimation. And that's the interesting thing for me. I think pose estimation has always been interesting because if we can detect, like, you know, whether you have hand movements or how are you moving your, your, your face, are you smiling, uh, you know, what kind of gestures you use, hand gestures, I think that has a lot of applications in, in various settings, could be retail analytics, you can think about people in a shopping mall, but uh, this specific application is uh, interview videos, and so, you know, I'll just go over the title once more, AI and AI human-based salesperson hiring using interview videos, it is the last chapter of my dissertation, uh, and it's, it's with my dissertation advisor, Professor Sudhir at Yale University, and to very dynamic co-authors, Kai and how they are from University of Texas in Dallas and uh, you know so and Howard is the director of the sales uh, research lab at UT Dallas and uh, he he was uh, and this was just a lunch conversation where he said that you know we have say we have a sales lab and there are these uh, you know internships that happen every year where you know students come in and industry people come in and they are asked to do a research uh, sales pitch and based on the pitch they land the internship or they don't land the internship and and also they get like feedback on various dimensions and I'm like this data is being recorded then why has no research been done and you know that's because nobody was thinking about it for research but they have a wonderful database of uh, you know videos collected over the years uh, we finally used a small data sample and I'll, I'll talk about those things but that was the motivation of starting this research um so more specifically, what is the setting? So it is say, um, Salesforce recruitment and training is a huge cost for firms. Like recruitment in general is very, very expensive. And uh, especially Salesforce and, and some of the reasons are, you know, you need to judge a lot of soft skills when you're picking up a salesperson. And hard skills judgment is, can be reasonably easily automated. Like you can see somebody has, some programming experience or has worked with Python, but how do you judge whether that person would be persuasive or, you know, would be able to build a repo? So those are more challenging problems. Um, in this setting, we have around, uh, 
200 interview videos. There were a lot more videos, but you know, because uh, sometimes the recording is not perfect and storage has issues and I'll come to some of those. So we used 200 videos of interviews structured in the format of a sales pitch. And though it sounds like 200 videos, but it's 4,000 minutes of rich multimodal data. Every video is 20 minutes of conversation. And there is a lot going on there where, you know, you can observe not only what the person is saying, but how they are saying what body language they're using and so on. Um, now, coming to the basic question, you know, what is the what is the challenge? What is the debate? Why use algorithms for hiring? And there are a lot of, you know, this has become a new growing cottage industry. There are so many firms which are uh, in the domain of algorithmic hiring now. So the basic, uh, you know, the plus or uh, in, in the argument in favor is that, you know, uh, hiring itself by design, it's a prediction problem. You observe somebody for a small time and you're, pre you're trying to make a prediction whether or not this person would be a good salesperson, whether or not this person would be a good marketing professional. So by design, it is a prediction problem. Then why not, you know, use prediction tools? It, there are implications for cost reduction. And more importantly, there is a lot of research to show that uh, it could maybe even improve human decision making if you have algorithmic support, because these are time constrained situations. Like, you know, we know how job hiring or especially campus hiring, it, it goes on so fast, so quickly so many decisions are made and and that's why there is probably even a chance that algorithms can improve human decision make, making in this time constraint environment but there are also a lot of arguments against why not algorithmic hiring the biggest is explainability you know can these algorithms really explain what's going on like why why was i rejected for a job like you know what factors went into my selection or my screening out there could be algorithmic bias and there are a lot in us there are a lot of laws right now which in fact make it almost impossible for you to have or use any kind of software for hiring which cannot be explained and new york is you know i, I think there are more states that have joined but New York was one of the early states which said that you cannot use any AI um, based algorithm for hiring if you cannot explain the decisions of the model. So there are like arguments both for and against and now coming to what are the specific research questions that we want to answer given our data set and you know the cons uh, the constraints of our setting um so step 1 we want to build a predictive model of sales interview scoring and we want to do it using theoretically motivated uh, features. The reason being, um, I, in in a lot of my earlier work, I have used deep learning models for you know on studying online reviews. But this is just a different domain. There is a lot a uh, lot more strict laws here, which demand that you know we need to understand what's going on. And secondly, the sales. Salesforce literature, traditional sales and marketing literature in this domain is very rich. So we already know that, you know, there could be these features which are important. It's just that it was hard to actually uh, make variables out of them or test them empirically. So there, this is not an area where we know nothing about. In fact, you know, there have been there has been a lot of survey based work and we should be able to use something from that. So uh, in in this uh, in this you know uh, step one of building the predictive model, we basically want to answer the question that you know first of all, can you use AI reasonably for making these screening and selection decisions? A lot of the AI now nowadays is used mainly for screening, so just figuring out who are the worst. But if we have more rich data, if we have video data, can we also use it for making, you know, the more important decision that who is the top? Can you select the top 10 or 20? And the second is like, you know, which features and variables actually explain the decisions of the AI and understanding this has two types of implications. So one is, um, and this is, you know, when I talk with companies which actually uh, work in this domain, uh, it's not the same thing, you know, st uh, storing text data versus storing entire videos. They're just not the same. The privacy issues are quite different. If you are just going to store the interview transcripts for two years, that may be fine. But storing a video which has a lot of personal identifiers, that's a different thing. So 
actually need all these modalities you know how much are you learning from the text how much are you is the video adding to it so that's something we want to study second uh for going back to our early earlier question you know on uh, sales recruitment is challenging salesforce training is even challenging so is there something to learn from this model and you know the features that come out to be important that we can pass on as advice for salesforce training so that's the other uh, you know uh, thing that we are trying to handle uh, in this paper and this uh, the second question really is um, and if you talk to anybody in algorithmic hiring what they would say is no matter how good the ai becomes you know it might be the best model but still this is a very high risk decision and nobody is okay to just you know give it give it up to ai so human involvement is necessary and i think this is a consensus but what is not understood is how much of human involvement do you need at which stage do you need the human involvement and does it really improve decision making i think these things have not been systematically studied at least in the salesforce domain and so that's why uh, you know our paper has two parts so it has the ai part and it has the hybrid part and I'll just be going over our main contribution and just pausing for a bit after that to see if there are any any questions or clarification. So re reiterating, like what are we trying to do in the paper? Uh, so you know, left hand side shows the this current state of the art, and right hand side is what we are trying to do. So currently, AI based hiring uh, is is becoming pervasive. There are a lot of tools, Hire View, Humanly, Amazingly Hire. There would be more, but it's it's quite focused on screening and it's quite focused on hard skills. Uh, interactive rich video-based evaluation for hiring decision support. I think this area is understudied. It's uh, our study is one of the first in sales recruitment domain. Uh, the second thing is, you know, when it comes to the actual sales process, we know very little, though there has been, have, has been, there have been a lot of studies that have used surveys, but we don't really know exactly what's happening in that sales pitch situation, which is leading to success. And now having granular video data, timestamp data, we can actually see what are the micro success factors, not just high level tactics. The third thing is explainability is a challenge in this area. And what we are trying to do is by developing a theoretically driven model, we are trying to, you know, come up with a fully explainable uh, Salesforce hiring decision support system. And finally, like I said, where there is very limited empirical modeling and testing of these kind of hybrid models. So in theory, we understand that, you know, human intervention in these kind of models can help. But in this paper, we want to build and evaluate the performance of a hybrid AI human model. So I'll just stop for a bit here and see if there are any questions and then I'll go ahead. Yeah, very interesting topic. Yeah, we have a couple of questions. Uh, one is from Professor Samrat Gupta. So uh, he mentions an interesting research question study. Uh, so the interview setup might be located at different geographies and culture might not be captured in video data. Also, the interpersonal dynamics between interviewee and interviewer might vary from one interview to another. How can mm -hmm. algorithms and prediction model control these kind of variations? Uh, mm -hmm. That's one. Then there is another question uh, from Jigyasa. Is sample taken from a particular place or um, any industry? She wants to know. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a question from Samruddhi as well. Uh, uh, okay, I think, yeah, maybe we can address a couple of the first two. Sure, topics. sure. Yeah, and I think the first uh, two questions have some commonalities. So, you know, the setting and what happens in different cultures. So, yeah, so our setting is sales interviews. So that's why, you know, all the claims are with respect to Salesforce hiring only. Um, the the culture question is very interesting. In fact, I would like to see like what would, would what would be different if we could replicate the study across different geographies. Right now, it is uh, one large U.S. public university, and uh, the students and and the nice thing about Texas is it's it's kind of heterogeneous. Like unlike some U.S. states, there is I think uh, and you know when we were looking at the demographic and racial profile, so I think uh, there was a good amount of heterogeneity, and I'll show some of the data in a bit. But 
but but I think that's a fair question. What would happen in a different setting uh, that that we don't know? Uh, sorry, what was the what was the second question? Uh, uh, so again, about you know any particular sector that you're looking at. Sales yeah, so this is this is very very much Salesforce only, and I think there is uh, there is uh, you know we should do it in different settings and different industries before we can say something like widely generalizable. But what I can tell you is that you know what all the existing industry tools that we have looked at and they are being used across several industries but the focus is almost always on getting the hard skills you know resume screening filtering out and here we are trying to look at soft skills in general and uh, one one thing that i did is i was reviewing that you know what are the different soft skills needed for different types of jobs and uh, there is a us department of labor website that does a good job of you know saying that oh in, if you're a salesperson these are the soft skills you need if say you're a professor these are the soft skills you need and some of these have overlaps uh, you know persuasion for example rapport building so yes. i would say that parts of what we build might be applicable to other settings but but we have to evaluate that and you know I, and i am very much a sales marketing person so this is my world uh so i wouldn't make a lot of claims on other domains but i think uh you know once we have a good model and the constructs are well built well um and I'll, I'll tell you what are the constructs like persuasion is one communication is one maybe we can take some of this and then try try it out in a different setting yeah, there is another question. I think we can address that at the end, which sure. talks about how should we kind of, uh, what skill set should we have if AI comes in? I think your second part research question is about AI human augmentation, right? So I think we'll have mm -hmm. some uh, insights from them. And there's some question on salient features of video. Maybe I think as we go on to the... Yeah, so I think yeah, I, uh, maybe I'll talk about the results in a bit yeah. that might answer yeah. some of the questions, else we'll just come back to it right. in the next round. Yeah. Uh, so we'll so I will, I don't know how we are doing on time. Maybe, is it already... Yeah. Uh, no, 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 it's not. It's, it's 20 okay. minutes, yeah. Okay, so I will uh, not go through the literature review. Uh, if anybody is interested, you know, I'm happy to share it. Uh, and, you know, like Professor Adrija was telling, this is very interdisciplinary. So we ended up doing a lot of literature review. Uh, we make contributions to different domains, uh, but primarily to study of, you know, uh, deriving uh, constructs which are complex like persuasion from unstructured data and in computer science there's a lot of interesting work uh, where people are trying to study engagement from influencer videos or you know uh, which crowdfunding pitches are interesting that kind of stuff I think uh, one thing which is interesting about our setting is many of the settings that study persuasion is single shot one-sided instances of persuasion so when you make a uh, you know pitch on a crowdfunding website it's just one person making the pitch and that's it but here you will see the back and forth so there is an interviewer and interviewee uh, it's a two-way communication and that allows us to actually create very interesting features like adaptation and I'll talk about that so that was interesting to me about the setting second it's uh, it's definitely related to the larger sales literature on sales influence and tactics uh, which is very old like you can see one of the early papers was written in 1963 but in spite of this, a lot of things in this literature are unresolved. For example, you know, this question of whether or not, say, uh, two people who are in a conversation, especially in an interview or that kind of a setting, should they mimic each other or not? Is having too much similarity good or bad? And people have not had like very clear yes or no answers to those kind of questions. Again, because at that time, video data was not easily analyzable. We could not construct real time features like, you know, uh, whether or not my body language really maps to your body language. So I think we are in a better position now to answer those questions and revisit some of those studies. And finally, coming to AI human hybrids, I think uh, this is a very very interesting area and there's so much happening in the uh, you know area of self-driving cars teaching sales coaching and if you see a commonality in all those questions and our question it's basically the settings where people are talking about hybrid is our settings which are very high risk so you know every decision is costly and so people are just not ready to accept that we can give everything out to ai so human involvement is needed uh but 
it needs empirical testing and we need to see exactly where the involvement can help. Um, now, this is coming to some of uh, the key results. And even if, you know, we don't get to see all the results, so at least we have this summary. Uh, so our it's a feature engineered based, uh, uh, you know, um, predictive model, we, the accuracies that we see are in the range of 64%. It has improved to 70% now while we were revising the paper and you know improving the feature engineering process. It compares well to um, all the existing studies that we have on persuasion or interviews and that use feature engineering. And again, remember this is a dom and this is a domain problem, not just a problem of our paper that you wouldn't have a lot of interview videos. So when I used to work with online reviews, my data set used to be millions of reviews and and it's easy to get millions of reviews but to get even like 200 videos which are nicely done recorded is challenging and this is one of the problems in video analytics that you know we don't have large scale data sets that we do have in image and text um some interesting learning so you know we did the study so by modality so we basically what this result means is that uh, which modality of the data and by modality I mean text audio visuals and like you know the nice thing about video data is it has all these modalities in itself so you observe the visuals you can get a transcript which can give you the text and the voice can be extracted separately and so we wanted to study that when it comes to screening the worst versus selecting the best are there any differences in which modalities matter and what we find is that you know, when it comes to figuring out who the worst is in the Salesforce scenario, um, the voice is actually very important. So if the voice is not energetic to begin with, a lot of people are, are, are getting screened out. But when it comes to asking the other question, like, you know, who is the, the best person? And uh, that time people are thinking more deeply about language style you know, things like how precise you are when you're making those arguments. And there's also actually, uh, you know, the other kind of thing that we studied is, and this is a very, um, you know, a question that is, that's been forever in, in even in marketing and persuasion in general, like is content important or style important, you know, what you say matters, how you say matters. And, and, and there's a third dimension, the interactivity, because we have a two way communication. And we, we have largely found that stylistic features are very important, but not to say that, you know, the others are not. So especially again, when it comes to selecting who is the best, the content does matter. And so does interactivity. And, you know, I'll talk about interactivity in more detail because I think um, this is a setting which is very highly interactive. And what we found are some things like adaptation. And what I mean by adaptation is literally when say uh, the interviewer uses a certain kind of word, many times like interesting kind of we see some interviewees they take you know they start taking the cues and start using the same kind of language and which is called behavioral mimicry in in in, in psychology literature and we find evidence that this actually is helping them uh, so this is some overall results. We have uh, more detailed results on which features are most important and stuff. But coming back to the AI human hybrid. So what do we learn? What we learn is that even if there is just one human judge in the loop, so once the AI model is constructed, how do we think of the hybrid is that now you have certain scores that are coming from the AI. Now, suppose you also get a random judge score and you can do a Bayesian update of the AI score and the judge score, and then you have a hybrid score. So does that improve screening and selection? So the, uh, the, the short answer is yes, even one person is uh, you know significantly improving both screening and selection. And the other uh, side result that we get is that you know beyond three people, so and you know uh, you'll see our setting in our setting there are 10 judges. So we find that beyond three people, the, you, we don't see a big difference in, uh, in inaccuracy but uh, adding one additional judge is also justified and then we looked into what exactly is the hybrid doing how is it improving accuracy of screening or selection and we see that it actually reduces false positives in screening now uh, how do you think of false positives in the context of screening so screening essentially means that 
uh, who are the worst candidates? So am I in the bottom 10? Then I should be screened. So by reducing false positives in that stage, it's actually helpful because you know, you're not taking a lot of bad people to the next process, which could be which could involve more managerial time. So those are some kind of uh, analysis that we were trying to do. So yeah, the hybrid is working, but what exactly is it doing? And then we also looked at stages of the interview. So for example, you know, you take uh, and we could do all this because our judges score each of the stages of the interview and we also have a final score so what happens if we use human judgment only for you know the first three or four minutes and then we don't and we see that that actually works so human judgment is quite critical for the first three to four minutes of the interview and the rest of the interview we are learning less and and we are still you know trying to understand this result honestly and it because i think the challenge with this result is uh, it could be either because humans are so biased that they make all their decisions in first 3 4 minutes and you know after that their score the scoring is simply not changing you cannot change the um, idea they've built about the candidate but it could also be that you know something happens early on and in sales uh, I'll talk about the seven steps of selling. There's the first step is rapport building, which is building a human connection. So maybe humans are just good at judging that human connection. And uh, this is one area we want, we are working on trying to understand, you know, what, what is driving these results. But overall, the recommendation is that we can definitely use AI for screening. Uh, because you know uh, it improves accuracy and also uh, the cost. Uh, the cost is not much, but augmented with human judgments based on early stages of interview for selection. So when you're making that high level, the more uh, high risk decision of who should be the top ten, that is where human judgment can you know make a lot of difference, and that additional cost is justified. Um, I'll get into the data, but do you think there is anything at this point? Any questions? We are good to go. Yeah, we can take the questions maybe later once. Okay, done. sounds good. So this is an, a very high level overview of the result. Our paper is available on SSRN. So if anybody you know uh, wants to understand the results in more depth, uh, please reach out to me or read the paper. But let me talk a little bit about the data setting. So I, like I said, these are all sales interviews. So all the 200 interviews. And every interview is a role play. So essentially what happened is the students were told that you have to sell a CRM software to a buyer and the buyer is a well-trained you know industry person who has been working in sales for several years and the buyer is going to make the decision uh, whether you're not whether the candidate would be hired or not but it's not just the buyer um uh, there, each interview is also judged by nine to 10 external judges. And how to think, you can think of this as, you know, nowadays when a lot of interviews happen, there is one person, a more junior person usually conducts the interview. And there, there could be observers, there could be people from HR, there could be seniors who are observing the interview, and then everybody gets to score. So it is that kind of a setting. So the same interaction is being judged by multiple people. And just going over the interviewee and recruiter democracy, graphics so among the students we have a good gender balance like they were almost 50 percent male and female among the recruiters also we have uh, a good balance of genders as well as experience so some people are, are high experience some people are low experience uh, and the people who are observing the judges again there we have a good mix of genders experiences and we also have a good racial diversity it's just that you know our uh the, the from where we got data we were not allowed to classify the data by race but we had done some background checks and you know that's a nice thing about texas that we could actually find people who come from different uh the different racial backgrounds different in you know countries and so on um but again the setting is very very much one university in the u.s and we have not replicated this study across different geographies um now what is the and the next important thing is you know what are the metrics now when you have to build an ai model of course you need features but you know you also need some scores that you try to predict and what excited me when i saw this data set was that the judges in this case they were giving scores on 
four or five dimensions which are actually quite critical for uh you know making this decision of who is a good, good salesman uh so there is this competition in us which is national college collegiate sales um, competition and we f they follow the same judgment criteria wherein um the questions that are asked are you know now you have seen this interview how do you think this person did uh, on the approach like you know and an approach again uh, the judges are trained uh you know what really means good approach so you know was the introduction professional did he manage or he or she managed to gain attention build rapport and so on then there's the next stage so after approach it's needs identification so imagine a general sales call you first build rapport then you try to identify what are the needs of the consumer uh you know what are they lacking what can our our product do for them then there is a demo then there is objection handling where uh, you know the buyer is asking very pointed questions on why should we pay so much or why is this software better than the other software and and the sellers have to respond to that and then there is closure and they are given scores on each of these stages and uh, not just uh, one judge but 10 judges are giving scores on so many dimensions and now purely looking from a machine learning researcher perspective like many of us know like how difficult it is to get any kind of uh, reliable training data on AmTurk, like you know, from normal people. And this data was coming from experts, and it was labeled on so many different dimensions. So that is what was very exciting to me, like to begin with, when I was not even thinking about the bigger implications, but simply from uh, building a prediction model point of view. What was interesting is uh, there was a multi multi-dimensional rubric. There was a structured interview and there were these very interesting videos from which we could build features and so very quickly i will go into the model itself uh how does the model work so we have these videos we converted into the three uh modalities so we extract transcripts from videos uh, the audio and the visuals are just the frames of the video so if you uh so video can be you can think of a video as a sequence of frames so the visuals are already there the audio and the transcripts were extracted separately and then we we started doing feature engineering that you know what features matter in this domain um and what i'll do is i'll come uh i'll come back to the benchmark later um and talk about the features first because i think um i've already been talking about the features so uh our feature engineering exercise uh it was inspired by this the rich literature in pers persuasion and sales influence and what we learned from this literature is that there are three big blocks of uh features which matter so the content clearly matters what is being said and we could do a, a, a topic modeling and an lda sort of model to figure out that you know um and and it was not uh, and one thing to note here is everybody was kind of selling the same product uh, and that's why you know the content itself does not vary so much the approach needs um, you know the things they're talking about doesn't vary a lot but what varies is how much time they spent on each topic so there are people who would talk a lot about technology and not the business side of it there would be people who would talk you know spend most of their time in uh, you know talking uh, building rapport and then mostly about business and very little about technology so there is variation in that dimension but not exactly in what people are saying there's a lot of variation in style though and by style we looked at linguistic style, vocal style, and body language. And there is a lot of uh, variation in interactivity. And I'll talk a, a lot more in detail about, you know, um, the body language aspect and the interactivity aspect, because I think uh, the other aspects of style, like linguistic style, they're more well studied. So we also use some well-known libraries for things like, say, politeness or competitiveness. Uh, but I think uh, what was interesting for us is to figure out the body language piece and the interactivity piece so how do we get the body language um um and what do we even which are the what what types of body language even matter for sales so hand gestures is an important uh you know class of body language features that matter hand movements in general so how quickly you're moving your hands uh posture and torso movements so a lot of people are very upright you know when th throughout the presentation they would just not move some people have more relaxed postures some people just have more variation in their postures the other uh, thing that varies 
across people is face movements. You know, some people tend to move their face a lot, nod a lot more, and uh, some people don't. And and eye contact. And you know, there's a lot of literature that says that you know eye contact or having enough eye contact matters, and and so on. So these were the features that uh, we thought were important. The other features which I think were important, but you know, uh, we could not really get them reliably from our data is how much you're smiling. Uh, the reason is these are side views. So when these videos were constructed, um, it was like one person talking to the other person and we, you know, everything is side view. So I think we, we could not really get a reliable measure of smiling. And so um, that's something which I think is a limitation of this work. And uh, and I think, uh, you know, and uh, we are still doing some data collection to extend this work. And now we are more careful of having two cameras, not one, so that you can have the full frontal view. Uh, but just showing a little bit of how uh, the tool that we use to extract these features, and that's called open pose. What I like about open pose is, you know, from the name itself, is it's open source technology. It was developed by CMU Robotics Lab but the code and everything was public for a long time. So what it allows you to do is as a researcher, uh, you can think of what types of body language matter for you. And you can actually, you know, train the model and tweak it, it uh, and change the code to make sure that those are the exact key points that you're deriving. So this is just a small uh, video. I'll not play the whole of it, but just for you to get a sense of how uh, OpenPose works. So like you, like you can see what it has basically done is converted these two humans into, you know, their into, you know, bare bones or skeletals in, in the terminology of open pose, it's called key points. So what it is doing is it's helping you to detect certain key points throughout the conversation. And now uh, that you have seen, you know, how this is working, let me actually talk a little bit about key points itself. Um, so the, this is the general structure of how open pose works. It's a two stage thing. The first stage is any kind of video that is sent into open pose. The first part of it is, first of all, object detection. So it starts with object detection. It helps you to detect like, you know, a video could have tables, benches. It also has human beings. So you first have to detect that, like, you know, who are the human beings in the video. And after doing that object uh, detection piece, the next fun part is the key point detection. And the version of the uh, of OpenPose that we used that had these 19 key points, but that's not a limitation. If you care about more key points, you only have to, you know, retrain the model. But in this version, there were these key points which had, you know, and, and what I mean by key point is uh, anything that can help any, any uh, point in the body that helps to um, um, help you to come up with, you know, some kind of a pose. For example, um, you know, having a straight hand is a pose. And, and a key, an example of a key point would be the left elbow, left hand, left shoulder, nose. So these are all key points. So once the key points are detected, the next challenge is actually to, to detect the linkage between two key points. And that's what, that's the second or, you know, step two of open pose. So first it detects key points, then it detects the edges. And then together, what you get is you get these uh, the exact placement of the you know particular body point at but at a particular uh, point in time. So what we can measure is uh, you know whether you had a straight posture at time t and did that post posture change at time t plus one. So it allows you to do that level of detail pose detection, uh, which is what I love about open pose. I'll not into get I'll not get into the details of the model, but for those of you who are interested, uh, they have a fabulous documentation. Uh, the you know the people who first constructed open pose um, and it's essentially uh, there are CNNs working within which do this twofold task one is detecting key points and the other is detecting the edges or the connections between the key points and it's it's a pretty time consuming software it takes a little bit long to run like we had specialized GPUs and stuff and still it takes a little bit a little while to run uh, but it's it's a fascinating experience and the other thing I want to say about open pose is we have used other tools um, but the challenge we were facing is we had two people, right? There, there's an interviewer and an interviewee. And what we cannot afford is we cannot afford mixing of 
uh, body poses. So we really need to make sure that what we are detecting belongs to the interviewee or it belongs to the interviewer. And this is a challenge in a lot of pose estimation tools and open pose is able to do it quite well. And it can even do it in multiplayer settings. So we have just two people, but say you have 10 people or even more, uh, it actually you know uh, scales up pretty well. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about, for, about uh, you know, when it comes to feature, uh, featured extraction is this interactivity bit. And to me, it's it's very interesting because I have also worked in sales and I, I, I actually genuinely had the intuition that, um, you know, tailoring what you're saying and how you're saying to the other person has implications. And but it's not easy to measure things like real time adaptation. And what the, what I mean is, you know, here uh, on the right hand side, I have an example of what is adaptation. So you can see an interviewer saying things like kind of, kind of, yeah, so that is his style. And then the student starts adapting that same style. And we actually saw this in the transcript many times. And the question was, you know, how do we measure this adaptation? And that actually led to, to more exploration. And I found that, uh, you know, Cornell has this amazing uh, toolkit, which is called Convo Kit. And it's a very general toolkit for modeling any type of conversations. And what I like about it is that, you know, any kind of conversational data can be converted into uh, it's called ConvoKit format. And what it basically means is if you see the picture on the left, uh, we have a timestamped conversation here where speaker one says something, then speaker two says something. And we also have, you know, the exact time when this was said. Uh, so this kind of a data can be very easily converted into a ConvoKit transcript, so as to say. So it converts it into a sequence of utterances and turns. So utterances is when one person speaks and turn is when, you know, the conversation floor changes from one person to another. And once you have the data in that format, there are many cool things you can do. You can measure things, not only simple things like number of turns or, you know, share of voice, but you can start measuring some very interesting and complex things like linguistic adaptation and so on. So these are two very cool features I think that we were able to construct because of Convocate and Open Pose. And we do a bunch of other feature extraction, you know, um, on linguistic style. I'm not going into the details because uh, this has been done in other work. For example, you know, you can find out whether the person is being polite or not, competitive or not. And uh, what we do is not different. We also use LIWC. It's just that sales is a more specific context. So we had to add certain words to these existing pre-existing dictionaries, which are specific to sales. Like, you know, like in normal conversations, people don't say things like beat competition or, con or challenger or entrant. These are more like Salesforce talking and language. So we add, so we added those things to existing dictionaries, uh, but otherwise our approach is, is pretty similar to what people have done in the past. Um, now I'll go back like, you know, from the feature extraction part, let me talk a little bit about what is the metric or the Y variable that we are trying to predict. Uh, a most obvious choice could be we have 10 judges. We could take the average of all the judges and, and that's fine. Um, I don't, I don't see any challenges with that. But the interesting thing in our data was there was a lot of variation in the judges also. Like some were experienced, some are male, some are female. So we thought that can we actually, uh, you know, derive a metric of candidate ability score using a fixed effect model. So basically, that helps to control for some idiosyncrasies of the interviewer. Uh, and we could do this because the same person is interviewing more than one person. So, and I can tell you what we can measure from this. So something like leniency, right? Like everybody complains, some professors are lenient, some are not. But if you see their, them grading students over time, you can figure out who is lenient and who is not. So that was the idea we used and we derived this metric of score. But I don't think our results change a lot, even if you just use the plain average. There are other things that change. So we did some uh, cool like analysis on the side. We were trying to figure out like, you know, if you only used the scores of the male judges or only the scores of the female judges, how does it change the mix of top 10, top 20? and it does change and what we observed like one cool thing we saw is that you know when uh, males were evaluating males they were being much more strict for whatever reason um, and so there, there were these kind of interesting things going on and which is why we feel the fixed effect makes a difference not so much in accuracy but in the mix of top 10 top 20 that you get 
And and I think that's, uh, you know, actually looking at why this is happening is beyond the scope of this paper, but we have some follow-up work to understand like how the, uh, you know, mix of panels uh, actually has an impact on the final selection. Uh, and so, yeah, that's a feature engineering grid. That's a prediction task we are going to do. Now I can quickly show you some results, which I also talked about in the past. How much how much time do we have? And do Maybe five minutes uh, and five minutes for Q&A. We have some questions on the chat box. Okay, so then I'll just quickly go through the results and uh, and we can just, you know, hop on to the questions. So I won't go into, you know, each and every table, but like I said, uh, the model has good accuracy both for screening and selection compared to any existing benchmarks, uh, which predict complex things like persuasion. Uh, what we also looked at is how well it's predicting different types of scores, you know, and because our judges have given scores on persuasion, confidence. So it is doing pretty good at predicting both, uh, you know, more objective elements elements, like you can think of need identification as more objective, whereas persuasion and confidence is more subjective. And we don't see a real difference in when it comes to the root mean square values, uh, when it is in predicting the uh, objective or subjective elements. Uh, we looked, we did a, and we did a, a very detailed study on modality and which features matter. And I'm happy to, you know, answer any questions on that. But overall, we see that, you know, the text, all the textual features and interactivity features are really important and especially like I was saying adaptation and I was very happy because that was my intuition that adaptation should matter and when it comes to similarity vocal similarity does have a lot of impact um, and and I, I I actually you know some sometimes I'm like okay this is a cool result but somebody cannot change their voice tone in the middle of an interview uh, but I think it's just something to keep in mind just being able to match the pitch if not the tone or quality of the voice that can have some some impact. Um, we did all these, um, you know, other analysis just to see the how these different features impact the overall score. Uh, so uh, pa what partial dependency plots allow us to see is, you know, the, uh, we know that one feature is very important, but we don't know whether the impact is positive or negative. And so, for example, we found some interesting things like talking too much about technology was actually negative. And uh, the other thing we found is being too competitive, using too much competition words was not helping them either. We found some interesting like inverse U kind of relationships when it comes to hand movements, uh, which also, you you know, um, some of the judges agreed with us, like when there are too much of hand movements, it can actually be distracting. And mm -hmm. but when there is none, it might show that you're not energetic. So these are some things where there is a certain optimal point beyond which the effect could be negative. Um, and on the hybrid model, I think I don't need to spend a lot of time on the results because I talked about these results already. Um, but what I would like to stress and one result that we are really working to understand better is that humans are or the value of human judgment is much higher for evaluating the early stages of the interview, but not so much for the later stages. Um, so just to summarize, what did we do here? I introduced an in, uh, interview video based AI approach to I wouldn't say it's, uh, you know, it's basically to replace humans in hiring, but I think it's a decision support for humans uh, when it comes to hiring. It helps you to move just beyond resumes and it helps you to actually uh, automate the process of scoring soft skills and not just hard skills. What we learned is that different features and modalities have differential impacts on the screening and selection. Part of the problem when it comes to figuring out who is the worst, uh, audiovisual features matter a lot more. But when it really comes to figuring out, you know, who is going to be the top 10 salesman, people are looking at what linguistic style and also content much more deeply. And, and finally, augmenting AI with human does improve accuracy, but uh, the value of human is, uh, human uh, judgment is much more valuable in the initial stages. And even one person, adding even one person in the loop uh, results in significant benefits when it comes to accuracy. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, I can use the rest of the time for questions. And also, if you have more questions, you can reach out to me later. Thanks, Ishita. It was a really engaging talk. Uh, we have uh, quite a few questions, some clarificatory uh, questions as well. So Deep is asking, do you have the qualitative data available for each of the interview on human judgment that why a candidate was selected or rejected? 
Uh, mm-hmm. The reason is that if AI is trained on label data, mm-hmm. um, that just says a candidate was selected or not selected, then how do you bring explainability into your AI model? Yeah, that's a great point. So one thing is explainability is coming from trying to understand, you know, the features itself. So for example, we know that body movements and certain types of body movements are rela- are are uh, high have a higher correlation with being selected or not. But to your question on whether we have qualitative data, actually we have loads of qualitative data. We have not used it. We have only used it for validation. So what these judges do is after they finish judging an interaction, they also write comments and we actually have a lot of comments I think that could be a project in itself if anybody wants to analyze judges comments but we are mainly using it just for validation for example you know one of the results we get is too much hand movements is not good then what we un- adaptation is really good and some of the judges comments are also like you know I really like it when uh, he was listening to what I'm saying there was active listening and he was trying to change the pitch based on what I was asking for and then there are comments like why was this person shaking their hands so much or you know there was just too much uh, nodding so too much nodding you know like and students can get into that mode because they just want to show uh, we basically agree with everything so they can just you know keep nodding their heads and uh, judges actually noted that that's too distracting and so on so we do have qualitative data but uh, I don't think we have used it fully uh, uh, you know but that's a good suggestion maybe that could improve the explainability. Okay, so there are a few more questions. I'll, you know, uh, so if the salient, uh, this is from Angshuman, if the salient explanations generated by the model are available to a candidate beforehand, can the candidate necessarily improve their chance of selection? Could that be considered as artificially gaming the hiring system? Yeah, I mean, that is a fair question. And honestly, I'll tell you, so my students tell me they're using, they ha- they're forced to use higher view. Uh, because, you know, like, you know, even Adrija was saying a lot of companies nowadays use higher view. So there are ways to game the system. They actually told me that, you know, there are a few things we can do and we can get a higher score in higher view. So that's always there. I think um, the it's like a little bit beyond the scope of our study. It's an interesting thought exercise. What I would say is many of these are soft skills. I would say they're not hard to change immediately. Like if I tell you that, you know, this is this way of talking helps. I think with training, you would get there. But uh, I think gaming a system that's trying to predict ha- soft skills is, is harder. But that's a fair question. And we have to see what would be, what would this be in equilibrium? Where everybody knows how these softwares rate, will it will they be useful anymore? I think that's a good question to ask, even to people who are investing a lot in building these software. But uh, but yeah, point well taken. Um, I don't know what the future holds. Yeah, we have many more questions. Maybe I'll pick and choose three, four. I mean, this topic. Yeah, and you can also send it to me later on. So, uh, so there are a couple of questions on biases by Shreya and, you know, Akshay. Uh, mm-hmm. So one is, are there possible sources of biases in the training data itself? For example, if historically men were preferred, then mm-hmm. AI may kind of amplify this. There's also this uh, question like, you know, body language of different individuals from different backgrounds may differ and yeah. may be interpreted differently by the model. So your thoughts yeah. on that's that's a fair question. So first on the bias, uh, there is there is a chance of bias. Obviously, a nice thing is our data has a good mix of all genders and races, and we and and you know, like I said, I'm doing some follow up work. Uh, to see what kind of things can bias the training data. Uh, Some interesting like pre-findings like, you know, I was sharing is uh, we we don't actually see a lot of gender bias. Like it doesn't matter whether your evaluator is male or female, but the diet, the nature of the diet matters. So when females are... uh, you know, interviewing females and males are interviewing males. That has a has some implication, and it's actually sometimes surprisingly different. Like males are being more favorable to females, females are being more favorable to fem- uh, males. So I think, uh, uh, but I think one good news is uh, we did not see um, you know changing the composition. 
uh, having too much impact on the predictive accuracy of the model. But like, like I was saying, it does have an impact on who the top 10, top 20 is. So when we present our results, we have those caveats. But good question. Again, uh, body language and background, I think it's an unanswered question in the literature itself. There are differences. Uh, but I think there are also uh, some things that people agree on generally. For example, you know, to aggressive hand movements, like in any culture, people don't like it that much. Um, posture is something which is more debated. In, in US and many Western cultures, having a relaxed posture is fine. People don't judge you so badly. I have friends from more Asian countries and they're like, it's, it's not good. If you're going for an interview, you should not, you know, act relaxed. That's not the way to be. So I think those differences exist. And again, you know, what we can do from the point of view of this study is it will all be there in the caveats. And it'll be interesting to see, like, you know, when people do other studies in other settings, uh, what are the outcomes? What is generalizable and what is not? Great. Uh, I think there's one question from Sai. Can the interviewer of the company tune the AI model before the interview to judge the candidates on set of selected metrics? Uh, or is it like a generic black box AI model that will define its own judging metric? No, the company can. So in fact, what we are proposing is the company has a few, uh, you know, past interviews and it, you know, you train the model based on that. And, and that's why the hybrid comes into picture. So once, uh, you know, you have a new interview, what you do is you use the pre-trained model, but you also have one person in the loop who can kind of give his judgment. And the AI judgment gets updated in a Bayesian fashion using the person's judgment. So that's what we have in mind. Uh, but it's also interesting what happens if the, you know, the model keeps changing in real time. I think that's also interesting. Like in a lot of uh, even uh, things like, you know, sentiment classification tools, which we have online, the idea is that you keep collecting data. And whoever, you know, whenever there's a new person coming in, giving you a sentence, keep taking that data and the model keeps updating with time. So I think um, that's also uh, an interesting thing. We have not visualized the tool that way. Uh, for us, it is more like a company has some data, build this model, and then what's the best thing to do? Should you involve humans or not? Or should you just use it the way it is? Great. Uh, thank you. I think we have run out of time. Thank you, Ushita. Really engaging talk. And you know, I'm sure there are many queries and questions. Feel free to kind of email uh, you know, Ishita and her. I think work is on SSRN, right? So right. Take, My uh, work is on SSRN. I'm happy to share a new draft or if you have any other questions about the data. Also, if anybody's working on similar things, I'm you know very glad to hear what you are doing. So please write to me. And again, thank you, Adrija, for this opportunity and all of you here for hosting me. Um, and just look forward to, her, you know, meeting yes. you all again, maybe in person, maybe virtually. Sure, definitely. Thank <laughs> you so much. And thank you all the attendees. Uh, have a good night and yeah, good day to you, Shita. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Let me. Okay. Bye, Adrija. Bye.